All right, ladies, I want to get started because I like to talk, and sometimes I run out of time, and I do not want to run out of time for what the Lord has trained me for for this morning. So if you have a post, if you do not have a post-it, can you let me know so I can give it to you? The post-it is for you to write an interview question. Any question, someone that you really want to get to know, what question would you ask? Okay, ladies, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So this is a get-to-know-you game. I, I uh, make up a lot of things to try to um, reach my goal. So I made this up, and I hope it works. <laughs> my husband's like, it sounds real made up. So, and it is very made up, so I'm hoping that it works and that you all didn't make two specific questions to the people you wanted to get to know, like what's your favorite song you wrote or something. Um, sorry, because I'm sweating, y'all. I think it's my nerves, but I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm just, yes, just the body, I guess. I don't know. I'm okay, I think. All right, so you have your interview question. This, I'm going to do the right left. Have you played the right left game? At the, um, okay, well, I'm going to read this, and you're going to do what what I'm telling you to do with your, your um, interview question. Okay, rem- bear with me. I made this up, okay? I'm, I'm being honest with you all. Okay. I left my house, so you have to go left. So when I say left, you go left, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. I told you I made it up, so I got to make up the directions oh, as we go. So when I say left, you got to go left. When I say right, you have to go right. Where do you go from? Back, just go back. Yeah, just go back if you're on the end. Yeah, I know, we're going to be real confused in here. Just bear. We're just all confused together. It's okay. We're going to get to the point of this. All right, ready? I left my house and was on my way to my mother's, my mother-in-law's house. I knew I was headed in the right direction for fun tonight. I arrived right on time and set up my display right over here. <laughs> just pass it, ladies, just pass. <laughs> we all making it up. <laughs> Jennifer has to <laughs> This is what happens when you make up stuff. <laughs> it's the spin circle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's made up. So, yeah. Okay, here we go. Are we good? Okay, for the sake of the game. For the sake of the game. Yes, just you can leave your things right there. You can sit there. But for the sake of the game, sit next to someone. Interview questions. Just write a question and just jump in when, you, when you're finishing your question. Okay, guys, we have two more minutes to do this because I don't want to take up our Bible time. Okay? All right, here we go. You all arrived and sat right down. <laughs> I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to get right to work and tell you all about our wonderful company. (laughs) Host this program and income opportunity. I hope nothing is left out. In a moment, I will be showing you more of our wonderful products. If you left home with the intention of shopping for gifts tonight, remember we have the right gift for everyone. Review your shopping list for upcoming birthdays and weddings. We wouldn't want anyone to be left out. Stop right there. All right. So you have this interview question in front of you. I need. So you have an interview question. It's okay if you don't have one. It's okay. All right. You have an interview question in front of you. I need three people to answer their interview question. Answer it. So read it and answer it. Yes, you're going to read it out loud. So (laughs) tell us your name and read your interview question and answer it. (laughs) Where are you from, Jenna? (laughs) Lawrenceburg. Okay, someone else. Very sweet. The interview question that you have, if you want to ask me the interview question, who who has an interview question that you want to ask me? Yes, ma'am, and I'll come back to you. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, so good morning. I'm Demika Jones. My favorite thing to do is probably come to church. I know that's real spiritual and like, ah, but I really <laughs> love Sundays. It's like on my favorite day of the week. And so, yes, that's my favorite thing to do. Oh, that's a good one, too. 
That's a good one. Okay. Um, so I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. I was born in Germany. My parents were in the service. I don't know my biological father. Um, my mother um, chose not to tell him about me um, because she thought he was involved in some um, illegal activity. So she didn't tell him, and so I never knew him. When she died, she told me his name. I forgot. It's easy to find him if I wanted to, but I can't remember the name she told me because it just wasn't, I didn't care. Um, and so as a child, I grew up in the West End of Louisville, um, and there was not a lot of professionals around me, and so I always wanted to be a teacher, but it was not an example around me, and all of my teachers in my entire life have been all Caucasian teachers. And so I just never thought that there was a possibility for me as an African American to be a teacher. And so I put the dream to the side, even though I know that the Lord had given me the desire when I was five. I played school every day of my life. I loved school, and um, that was my favorite thing to do as a, ch a child. And so I decided I was going to be a hairdresser. Every black woman in, in the West End of Louisville does <laughs> hair. So I was like, this is what I'm going to do. But in my hairdresser, it was going to be called, um, I forgot, it was in the Bible, the, 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 the crown of glory, because it talks about the hair is the crown of glory for the woman. So the shop was going to be called the crown of glory, and it was going to have a daycare-like school. So when the women came, then that would be my avenue to teach. And so while they were under the dryer, I would have like these 30-minute <laughs> times with the kids. That was my idea of how I was going to be able to get to, to be what I wanted to be. So where I am today, yeah, I just, yeah, it's the kindness of the Lord. My husband and I were talking about that on our way here because I got to teach yesterday at the Women's Advance, and it was amazing. I had such a wonderful time, and that the Lord would choose my vessel. I am, I am awful. Like, I am awful, and so that he would choose me to give his word just blows my mind. I am so delighted to be loved by him, to be chosen by him, to be kept by him, and then to be able to teach not only just um, elementary and public school, but I get to teach his Bible, and so that's just amazing to me, and I always delight in it. So thank you all so much for being here. I look forward to getting to know you more. We have two weeks, and so I um, have been led to teach you all um, how, I, how I was trained to study the Bible. And so before, that's a great intro, um, um, segue into getting to how I got to this study here. Growing up, um, I, I was brought up in a church going home. I, my grandfather was a pastor. I spent a lot of time with him. I learned the gospel through him. I, sh I saw how it was lived out through him. But my family, my mother and father, they just went to church. They wasn't Bible believers. They just went to church. They did the religious work. And so growing up, I did not see a lot of African-American women who were true to the Bible that taught. And so I was hungry for that. And even when I went to college, I still didn't experience it. I found educated African-American women, but not women that were educated and their worldview matched. It was always, I do this at work, and then I do this at church. And it never came together, and I never understood that. And I always had this desire for those two worlds to come together. I didn't want my church life to be Sunday, and then Monday to look totally different. That just didn't make sense. It didn't look like that for Jesus. Why does it look like that for me? And so I just always have had the desire to know how to teach God's word um, in a way that I could live it out. And um, the Lord led uh, my husband and I to Watson Baptist Church under um, Pastor Kevin Smith. And, um, yeah, the gospel was just really taught explicitly there. We just was fed really well. And then the Lord blessed me with a mentor, and, um, and then I got led to go to BSF. And so um, I was in BSF in the first month, and this is, I'm not boasting in this, this is not a boast at all, but the first month, because I love the word so much, they asked me into leadership. I didn't know what I was doing. I had only been there for a month, and we were going through what they're going to do next year. The Acts of Apostle is when I started, and, and so when I went into leadership, they taught me homiletics, and I fell in love with homiletics. Every other BSF leader, most BSF leaders do not like homiletics because it takes a lot of time. But it is just wonderful. And it trains you not only to apply the Bible to your life, but if you have a desire to teach and you're just not quite sure how to start or how, what that looks like, this is a great tool. And so I, I, it was sweet because when I learned how to do it, I, when I was listening to preaching, I would say, that sounds like homiletics. So I could literally write out their sermon. Like when pastor is preaching, I can go and write out his sermon. And it is like, I get this. 
is. It's just amazing. And so homiletics is just a great tool to study the Bible. And so I want to share with you my love. This is how I study the Bible. No matter what book, when I disciple women, I teach them homiletics and I teach them how to teach. So if the Lord does call them to teach and they can, but if he doesn't, it's a great tool to apply the word to your heart in order for you to walk out the Bible. And so that's what I want to share with you today. And the Lord has led me to the book of Jude. And so we're going to walk through Jude. Um, The name of our class is Sister Stand. And so Jude is a book that is reminding us of um, those who have walked away from the faith, the ungodly. And because they're ungodly, it's just a good reminder to us as believers that we can fall. And so what causes us not to fall? And so I just want to walk through that. How are we going to stand as sisters? How does the Bible cause us to stand and not fall away like the ungodly? And so we're going to walk through that, and we're going to do homiletics. So we may get through this whole um, homiletics study. I hope so. But I talk a lot. I enjoy talking, and I love women. And so I'm like, Lord, you're going to have to do this for me. Um, So I'm hoping that we're going to get through all of it. We may only get through the content and the divisions, but you have a green handout. It's supposed to be like a summer board or whatnot. I'm taking this jacket off. Okay. All right, so at the top, it's B, this is from BSF, but it's modified. So some of the things I took out um, from my handout from BSF in order to um, make it appropriate for our class. And so it says at the top, homiletics is for everyone who's, who wants to study and understand God's word. You don't have to be a Bible scholar, pastor, or leader. It's a tool to help you analyze a passage of scripture to more fully understand what God is saying to his people, you. Homiletics is also an effective tool for helping those who teach to create a message that relates God's word to its audience. So that's the purpose of homiletics. So before we start getting into the study of homiletics, I'm going to read through Jude and then I'm going to pray. And I choose to read first. I get this question often when I teach. Why do you read first and not pray first? Because I believe that God is faithful to his word. And so when I read his word, it's all in my mind. I'm saturated, and then I give it back to him because he's faithful to his word. He's not faithful to me. I, he's only faithful to me because I'm keeping his word, but it's him who he is faithful to. So I always choose to read the Bible first. Then I pray so that I can give his words right back to him because they're fresh. And so that's why I choose to read the Bible first and then um, pray. The way I like to pray is Acts because our minds, at least I'm going to just speak for myself, I am, um, you'll notice this as I teach. I like to, um, (laughs) my husband says, oh, we're getting off the topic. So I kind of like go this way, and then I come back. I mean, it's just how women do. When I talk to him, I'm like, oh, you you went this way. And so I'm teaching my husband how to talk, like how to follow me in my conversations, because he's like, I thought we were talking. No, babe, follow the track. Just follow me, huh? And so, (laughs) and so the way I pray is with the Acts prayer, because it keeps my mind focused. I don't, I'm not going to sway with the Lord. I need to be focused and not thinking about, oh, I forgot to make that oatmeal with the, I forgot to put strawberries in the oatmeal or, you know, whatever. The mind just drifts. And so Acts is just a disciplined way for me to stay focused so that I don't drift and go off on the sidelines. And so I'm going to allow, ask you ladies to join in with me in the Acts prayer. And so once I read the text, I'm going to ask you, how does the scripture adore God? What does the scripture cause us to confess? You don't have to tell like your deepest confessions. I understand. But we are called to confess one to another. So when you look at the text, what does the text cause you to confess? What does the text cause you to give thanks for? And what does the text cause you to want to pray and ask the Lord for? What is your supplication according to the text? Okay, and that just keeps our minds in the Bible and not on everything else. Are we, are we good? Okay, so I'm going to read you. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are the called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, 
our only master and Lord. Now I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and, and served as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Verse 8. In the same way, these people relying on their dreams defile their flesh, reject authority, and slander glorious one. Yet when Michael, the archangel, was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they do not understand. And what they do understand by instinct, like irrational animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them! For they have gone the way of Cain, have plunged into Balaam, Balaam, Balaam's era for profit, and have perished in Koriah's rebellion. These people are dangerous reefs. At your love feast, they eat with, without reverence. They are shepherds who only look after themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by the winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds. Wandering stars from whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. It was about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, Look, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in ungodly way and concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. These people are discontented grumblers, living according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time there will be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions in our worldly, not having the spirit. But you, dear friends, as you build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. What causes us to adore God from this text? Let's pray. Our majestic and holy and right Father, you are to be hallowed. Your name is altogether holy and it is good and it is right. Because of your kindness, Lord, you have called us. Because of your love, you have kept us. And we adore you today because of who you are. Because you are patient and you are kind. You are understanding. You know our ways before we even walk in them. You are a God that takes notice of your people. You are a God that loves your women so much that your son looked like he was going a different route in order to meet her at the well. That is the kind of God we worship and we adore today. And Father, when we consider how amazing you are and how good you are, Lord, it leads us to repent for we have been waterless clouds. We have sinned against you and we have rejected your authority as if it was to hurt us. We have grumbled in your good things and we have grumbled in our trials, though you have called us to rejoice. Father, we have sinned against you and for that we ask for your forgiveness and we ask that you would cleanse us. Oh, Lord, how we desire to love you more because you are deserving because you first loved us while we were yet helpless. You sent your son. And so, Father, forgive us when we did not give up our first love for you. And thank you that you give us mercy. 
thank you because of your son, Jesus Christ, we now, have, we now are seen as if we've never rejected you and as if we've always obeyed. You have justified us, Lord God. Help us and keep us from stumbling, God. And you teach us to do this by building ourselves up in you. We cannot do that apart from your spirit. Everything that you have called us to, Father, is done through your spirit. And so, Father, we're asking that you would give us more of your Holy Spirit, that we would build ourselves up in love. In our holy faith, God, we're asking for more of your spirit that we would show the same mercy to others that you have shown to us. That we're not quick to give up on those who stumble because we too can stumble if it was not for your mercy. Father, would this word do a great work in our heart that we would snatch and save others from the fire? Father, would you not let us be like just good religious people that come to Sunday school to check off the list or just to come to hear a certain person or sit with a certain friend, Father. But even if those motives are, purify our motives, Father, in order that we can be transformed and look more like your good gifts that you've given us. Father, I need you. I am relying totally upon you. And if you leave me, I cannot. I will fall. So will you teach me as my aim and my desire is to strengthen and encourage my sisters in order to stand in you. Thank you that you are trustworthy. And all these things we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, ladies. So let's look at our handout with homiletics. I introduced a little bit of homiletics. And so let's, I'm going to walk this way because that light. Um, I introduced a little bit at the top of what homiletics is. And so we're going to look at what is homiletics, why do we have homiletics, how do we have, hom and, and how does homiletics work. And so my aim is always Romans 12, 2. Every time I get in front of it, because I believe that a lot of the things that we do, of course, starts with our mind. And that's why the Bible tells us to guard our hearts. And so part of guarding your hearts is renewing your mind. And so Romans 12, 2 tells us to renew our minds so that we don't think like the world. And one of those ways to renew our minds is being in God's word, is studying God's word. It's his word that renews our mind. And so I'm hoping that today that our minds are renewed in the way that we approach the Bible, that we don't just pick it up and be like, oh, let me just read this good scripture and meditate on it all day. No, let's break it apart, make it understandable so that you can actually walk it out. And so I'm hoping and, and I'm, I'm asking the Lord that he would do that for us all today, that he would renew our minds. So what is homiletics? It involves a careful analysis of a passage of scripture with emphasis on both the content and application. So you're going to see the content is the, the more heavier part. And I, I hate to plant these seeds because I don't want you all to have the mindset like, oh, this is dreadful. Most of my disciples, when I'm discipling, they're like, do I have to do it again this week? Why are you not rejoicing in this? This is good stuff. Like, but the content is the harder part because you're literally writing every verse of the chapter. And it's, but it's so sweet to me. I don't know. I love it. Okay, let me go on. And so what else is it? It, it teaches technique and basic principles or preparation for preaching a sermon or teaching the Bible. And so a lot of people, my husband, we laugh at this because we've learned when, when I taught this at another church, they was like, the women shouldn't be preaching. My husband's like, preaching is proclamation. Like, they're not standing in front of a pulpit. I'm not affirming my wife to preach to men. But when she's teaching women, she is preaching because she is proclaiming Jesus Christ. So please don't get all in a tussy because you see the word preaching. Like, I'm not encouraging you to stand before men. I don't want you preaching in, in the church. I understand that. Okay, so there are five parts to the study. Y'all see how I went off? Like, I just go sideways? Okay, <laughs> I'm back. There are five parts to this study. And I laugh because I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm trying to teach my daughter this now. And so a way that I help her to remember that there are five parts is a high five. Like you cannot give me a high five unless all your five fingers are up. And so that is how I remember and I help her to remember. There are five parts to the study. You have the content, you have main division, subject sentence, aim, and application. So why do we do homiletics? To make us effective servant leaders. It is useful in enabling servant leaders to understand the passage and learn to draw out answers in such a way that grabs the full meaning of the lesson. I'm talking fast because I want to get through this here, and you guys can read this at home. Useful in, in servant leading other groups, Sunday school, church Bible studies, or devotionals, etc. 
useful in discovering a teaching potential. So if you have a desire to teach, I'm going to go on to the next one. It provides spiritual enrichment so that you can grow. So the value of studying is the exercise of doing it for yourself. You're not just letting Pastor York, who does it so well, he feeds us so well. But this is also an opportunity for you to go home and take it and and cut it up a little bit more. Bring it back up, chew on it again. And so that's what homiletics does for you. It gives you the the, the exercise of doing it for yourself so that it can become real. So how do we do it? Here's the meat of it. Hey, that just comes apart. Okay, y'all, so there's this new printer they got out that I tried, and they staple it, but these are the staples. Did y'all get this kind? Yeah, that's the new staple. Give me the staple. I want the staple. Okay, anyways, I went off again. Okay, the first step is content. This is the list of topics or events. So this is when you read the whole passage thoroughly, you get acquainted with it, and you're asking yourself, what is it about? What is this chapter about? You make a list of the different events, topics, or conversations in the passage. Your list should usually contain from 10 to 20 items, so it cannot be no less than 10. So if you have a chapter um, that has maybe eight verses, you're going to have to break those verses up even smaller in order to have 10. Because in order to have good content, you have to have at least 10 topics, no more than 20. If it's two more, more than 20, Research says that your brain it's harder for your brain to remember all of the content past 20. So there's some research done with the brain alongside of the homiletics. Um, and so I'll go on. And so you look for repeated words or phrases that seem t- to characterize the whole passage. Underline them and include them in your list. The list may be written in complete sentences, phrases, or combinations of sentences and phrases. Usually a single word is not enough to describe the content of the verses. So it does not have to be grammatically correct. My daughter loves this, this part right here, because she misspells. I mean, there's no commas. And so you'll see that even in the example that I give you with Ruth. Like, it does not have to be grammatically correct. This is for you to get it into your brain. But you don't want to use single words because that's not enough for you to remember information. So why do we do the content? This is the first step in remembering the details of the passage and allowing God to speak to you personally. So that's the purpose of doing the content. You cannot skip the content. You can't skip it. That is that is the heart of what you're doing here. So the next step is divisions. So this is where you take your Bible. So content was always really hard for me. So I took this out. BSF likes for you to use content. So if you did Number one, if you had verses one and two, you put those together. They only want you to write on one line for that verse. They want one line. I can never do that. The Bible has too much, and my handwriting is big, and I just can't get one line. So I took that rule out for me, and I took it out for y'all, but if you want it, go ahead. But I just don't do the one line. Um, And so I have, so that's one of the things that is different from here. So I wanted to let you all know that because someone who else have been trained by homiletics would say, you only are supposed to have one line. You say, well, D'Amika took it out. You talk to the teacher. And then I say, I just didn't want to do it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I couldn't do it. It was too hard. The content is always another difficult thing for me with the content was I felt like I was changing God's word. And I was like, I can't leave this out. This changes his word. But what happens with content, what the Lord has has taught me through content is that I'm writing it according to how he has fashioned me. And so though the Bible is God-inspired, when I'm doing the content, it is still God-inspired because I've taken his words, but I've made them applicable to how he has shaped me. And so the way, so you look at Paul's writing, you're like, oh, Paul writes like this. And then you look at Jude, and the writing is totally different. Like, like if you're looking up... Um, commentary they'll say oh we think such and such wrote Hebrews based on how it's written because that's their personality so you write in the way that the Lord has fashioned you so a lot of people can even don't write your name they can say oh she wrote this I've I've read this I, I know her writing and so that's what the content is so you don't you don't have to have this fear that I had that oh I'm changing his word no 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 you're not you're you looked at the word you copied the word and there's a lot of times where I take words and I don't know what it means and so then I'll look up the definition and I'll get a synonym and I'll use that because I like this word and I can pronounce this word and so um that's normally me I can't pronounce a lot of words and so (laughs) I pronounce I I change the word and so it's it's not you're not changing God's word you're looking at God's word and you're forming it in a way that you can understand it and then you can share with the people that God puts in your life So then you have the divisions. 
I'm giving you disclaimers there. Then you have these divisions, and you take a step back. So you close your Bible, and you're looking at your content. Because this is what you've taken. Is, these are the words that the Holy Spirit has illuminated. And so you take those words, and now you're going to break your own um, content up just the same way as the bible is broken up you know you have those little um, topics in the chapter that those are divisions they've broken it up in a way that they think that will help you to understand the bible so you're going to take your own content and you're going to break it up in a way that makes sense to you and so that's what divisions is you're just taking a step back and you're making them into smaller blocks in order so that you can remember the text this is all about how can i remember god's word how can i hide it in my heart and so you don't want to, you usually can have two to four. You don't want to have just one division for the whole chapter. That We'll get to that. You want to have at least two to four. You got more than four, that's just too many um, small brackets for you to, to remember. So you want to have two to four. And then the divisions is one complete sentence. So you take, so if you have 15 verses, you break it up into three divisions. Verses one through eight is one division. You're going to take all of verses one through eight, and you're going to make one complete sentence for that. What is one through eight talking about? Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> you're fine. It happens. Um, and so why do we do the divisions? The divisions is the, to refine the content list so that we can further remember the details of the passage and see in the thrust of the passage. That's the purpose of the divisions. Then you have the subject sentence. Your subject sentence summarizes the content. So you're no longer looking at the content now. You're now looking at your divisions. You're going to take your divisions, and you're going to make one sentence for all of those divisions. So you're just, you're just refining, refining, refining. You're just making it smaller and smaller in order to grab it into your heart. This is the challenging part. The subject sentence can be no more than 10 words because it helps the brain. So when you're talking to someone, it is less, and they can remember 10 words. So it's 10 words, no more than 10 words. So you're always trying to cut out your words. This is the fun part because I always have paragraphs because I talk too much and I have more words. I always have to say that he is and because. You got to take all that out and figure out those colons and this has got to gr be gr grammatically correct. And um, and so, the yeah, the subject sentence must be gr grammatically correct. I'm getting ahead of myself because I just kind of know this. So I'm sorry if I keep repeating. Um, the subject sentence has to be grammatically correct. Um, has to have a subject and a predicate. It does not have to be ca catchy. You don't have to be catchy. But the more you do it, the catchier you become. But you're not trying to be all creative and cute and catchy. And then you have, wait a minute, subject <laughs> sentence. Oh, I didn't put the aim on here. Y'all, this keeps me humble. Oh, it's on the other side. Okay. When I typed this and printed it out, I was like, wait a minute, there's a whole space. These things happen to keep me humble. I, you know, I get prideful, and I'm like, oh, I did that, ah, and then the Lord says, you messed up right there. So it just keeps me humble, and I receive it, Lord. I receive it. So step four is your aim. And so the aim is the main, can you find it? Yes, there you go. Yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, keeps me humble. And the, there you go, make notes. <laughs> you can't write something down, write it there. So the aim is, is where your main lesson, and this is what you want your audience to learn after hearing your lecture or your talk. It may um, be what you've learned after the study in the passage. What we, truly learn, what we truly learn and believe we can put into practice in our lives with the Lord's help. So for your aim, you want to ask yourself, what do I want my audience to know and live by? The, the aim must flow logically from the information in the passage. You can't just go over, oh, Pastor preach this sermon or are that sermon on the storm Woo, that sermon on the storm you can't go over and get his his notes from sermon on the storm you got to stay within your content and so you want to make sure that your aim is what your your content your division your subject it has to all flow okay so that is what your aim you want to pull from that subject sentence that you just written does that make sense okay and um Look at repeated words and phrases um, in the passage that helps um, for you to reach the aim. The aim always begins with cause my audience to learn. And so on my paper, you'll see C, cause, you'll see CTL, I, I abbreviate it, C-A-T-L or something, cause audience to learn. But you're always, what is it that you want to learn from this passage? The aim should be short and definite. The aim should always be, I didn't put this in here, the aim should always be about God. 
You should always be able to pull out. The Bible is for you to know who God is, to know your sin, to know why you need a Savior and what your response is. So your aim should not be Jonah Jonah was eaten up by the fish. No, 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 no. What did God do? God calls the fish to come and eat Jonah or swallow Jonah. And so the aim you want to always have, God, Jesus, the Spirit, you want to have our triune God in the aim, okay? The aim is to get the main teaching into our minds. This is where your mind is renewed, so it's in your mind. And your last step is your application questions. Yeah, time is not my friend. Okay, so the application questions is to transform your life. (laughs) What we truly learn and believe, we can put into practice into our lives with the Lord's help. Each division sentence along with the aim suggests a practical application of life. So what I'm seeing here is when you go back to your divisions, you go back to where you broke up the content, and you make a, a question for each one of those divisions. So if your first division, let's look at the um, Esther. So there's a content. My first division was back to Bethlehem. So in verses 1 through 10, it talks about going back to Bethlehem. Number one, the application question is, what brought you back to the place of security? So then you have to think, like, what, what, is secu- what do I think is security? What do I find security in? And what has drew me back to that place? And if that place of security is not Christ, if it's not a, a christ center, then you know that you have some repenting to do, and you have to remove this idol that brings about security in order for you to find security in Christ. And so these questions should cause you to think. You don't want to have yes and no questions. They're too easy. They don't jab at the heart. You want the word to, you want the word to be the sword that it is. You want it to divide the heart. You want to know what's going on in your heart in order that you would be worshiping God rightly. Okay? No. <laughs> That means I need to pray. <laughs> okay. And so that's what your application questions are. You want to look at each division, and you want to um, make an application question for each division. I always leave space for my application questions. You don't want to be the teacher that has all the questions and no answers. You want this to apply to you first before you want to share it with your children or your Sunday school group or whoever you're discipling. So answer the questions. So normally when I do homiletics, I do the homiletics. The next day I go back and I do one question. The next day I go back and do the second question. The next day, and that's how I study. Like all of my, my journals are all just homiletics. I just do homiletics through the whole Bible. And so in order for me to actually apply the word to get it in my heart. So you want to answer the questions for yourself. Um, And this is to get the main teaching into your heart. So we have moved it from just knowing it, this knowledge, to actually applying it in our hearts with our application questions. Now, these are things that I've come across, principles to remember. Do not strive for originality or brilliance. You are not trying to be original and nothing new under the sun. Okay, we're all copying off of each other. (laughs) Okay, so there's nothing new. I I listened to, we got to hear, what is her name? Uh, um, Elise Fitzpatrick, we got, to, oh, not only is she a good writer, she is a great speaker. Mm-hmm. Normally people who write well don't always speak well. But <laughs> she really is, I mean, she was fabulous. And everything she said, she was like, Martin Luther said, and such and such said, I'm like, Lord, there's nothing new under the sun. This girl has not said anything she said. She is just repeating off for somebody else. And, an original, uh, and it all goes back to what the Lord has said. They're all his words. We've not made up anything new. So do not strive for this. Don't strive um, strive for clarity. Strive for brief. I'm going to mess that word up. And and strive for simplicity. You want it to be, you want people to be able to get it. You want your little three-year-old to be able to get it. That's what makes Jesus so beautiful because he's for everyone. You don't want to be so smart that no one can get it. You want to make it clear and simple and brief. Remember the goal is to help you understand and apply the content of passage to your own life and to others that you want to lead. So this is the, this is the, the heart of homiletics. So I, give, I have given you an example with Ruth. Um, it is not the best. It is pretty rough, and, and it was on purpose. Um, And so if you look at my content here, I actually read through the whole chapter of Ruth 1. And I have 15, we call it 15 pieces of um, content. 
even though there's 22 verses, I had to figure out, you have to do some math and figure out, okay, if it's 22 verses, I have to have less, I can't have any more than 20. So how many verses do you have to put together? Two. 22, you have to put two verses together if you're going to do verse by verse. I didn't do verse by verse, so I put um, number four, you see I put verses four and five together. Number five, I put verses six and seven number six and so on so here's my content I sat down and I so if you go to Ruth you can see I shortened each verse like number one during the times of judges of famine in Bethlehem that's what it was about in verse one and so I just kind of summed it up in order for me to remember what's going on does that make sense okay so then I have my divisions my subject sentence there is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten words Naomi bitter back in Bethlehem with Ruth Moabitess beside her and so that's the point that I want to drive in I want to show him that she's going back and she has someone beside her my audience calls the audience to learn God can take you back and start a new beginning with a beautiful bond and then my application is what brought you back to a place of security who has been the person that will be buried beside you and how did you feel going back in the beginning and so it just gets to the heart of what's going on okay so we're going to do that through Jude you're all going to have homework. <laughs> Hi, I'm a teacher. <laughs> I give homework. All right, so let's look. We have a few minutes. So I want to do a few of the verses together. And I was going to write on this little nice iPad thing, but I'm, I'm not old, but I'm old. And so if, if that makes any sense. Um, so I still like paper and pencil. I like cards in the mail. You probably got a card from me. I like cards. I like stamps. We get bills in the mail. I like to open up cards. And so I just like to write on paper and pencil, um, even though it takes a longer time. Okay, so let's look at Jude. Let's look at the, the first four verses. And y'all, we're learning together, so just, just join in. It's okay if we make a mistake. It's not perfect. Remember, we're learning and we're growing together. So look at Jude. I'm going to read verse 1. What will we make for... Okay, so here's content. And don't judge me because spelling's going to be wrong. Don't forget to number so you can remember how many pieces of content you have. So number 1, we look, we're going to start with verse 1. So are we only going to do verse 1 by itself? Or are we going to do verse 2 together? So we're only going to do look at verses 1 through 4 together because that's all the time that I think we're going to have. So it says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do number one, and then you guys start working on We're going to do number two together, just so, so you can be comfortable and see. So what I did for number one, I put verses one and two together, okay? And one and two, I said, Jude, because that was important. That's who we're talking about here. And I love that he called himself a servant of Jesus. So that was important to me. I was like, oh, we know that he's a brother because he's a brother of James. But he called himself a servant. And so that was important because I, I, I had to ask myself, how do I identify myself with Jesus? Do I look at myself as a brother of Jesus? Then there is some pride that's going on that needs to be humbled. And so, um, so I'm going to write down Jude, a servant of Jesus, because that tells us who he is. <clears throat> A servant of Jesus. He is the brother of James. And it says, to the called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus. So I'm going to do my little colons because that means something. <laughs> I don't know. I can't think right now. To the called, loved. I don't sweat this hard working out. <laughs> By God, the Father, and kept for Jesus. And when you do um, homiletics, if you can't, if you're, you know, have to go to work and you can't do all of it, even if you do a couple verses, that's fine. You don't have to sit and get all of it done in, at one time. Because I have verses 1 and 2 here, so I'm putting, um, may mercy, peace, bless you, may mercy, peace, and love, I hope somebody's ready with the next one, and love, so I pretty much have all of this, <laughs> be multiplied, 
I didn't shorten this. I thought all of this was good and I wanted all of it multiplied to you. Okay, number two. What verses? We already have verses one and two. So what verses? Are we going to just do verse three? Are we going to put verse three and four together? What do you think? Three. Just three. Okay, so what will you say for three? <laughs> okay, somebody wrap it up. What's three? How are we going to wrap up three? Okay, beloved. Okay. What version of Bible do you have? Uh, ESV. ESV, okay. Um, beloved, say it again. Beloved, Jude wrote to wrote to who? Do you know who it was? Okay. Okay, beloved, Jude wrote to contend for the faith, right? Yes. Okay. So if it didn't say who in that verse, you don't have to put that. That's verse, what verse is this? Three. Oh, verse three. Contend for the faith. Is that all for verse three? Yeah, I think that's good because we know the purpose of why Jude is writing, writing the letter to contend for the faith. Okay, number three, verses four and five or verse four by itself. What do you think? Okay. So you see how, yes, so you picked that out. She didn't, and it's okay that she didn't. But when you write it, necessary means something. So, beloved, Jude found necessary, that is good, found necessary to write to contend for the faith. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anyone else? I want to teach this. I'm trying to stay focused. Number three, verse, do you do just verse four or verse four and five? What do you think? Just four? Okay. And what will we write for verse four? Okay. Restate it. Tell me what it says. So does your verse say beware? No. no. That's what you think of. What what makes you think of that? What does it say that makes you think of beware? The whole statement or is there a word in there that says? Okay. Crept in. Okay. Okay. No, I want to do what you want to do. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so what I want you to do is when you choose a word to be able to say, why does it say beware? That's why I'm asking you that. Because, because sometimes we take it and we spiritualize the text. We don't want to spiritualize it. We want to say exactly what the text is saying. And so, yeah, I see why you're saying beware. I want to make sure you know why you're saying beware. And so, yes, it, 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 it's saying that the godly is crept in. So there's, there is a beware. But we want to say, it's, yeah, the ungodly is crept in. Let's just say what it's saying. Yeah. Let's say what it's saying. Okay, so come on. Give me what I'm supposed to write. Tell me what to write. Because I've studied it, so I know if, you, if you're out of line on it. <laughs> Tell me what to write for verse 4. You said the ungodly? Okay. That's good. The ungodly. The ungodly has crept in unnoticed. Uh-huh. Is that two ends in unnoticed or one? Just one in. It's two ends in unnoticed? Okay. Okay. So the ungodly designated by God 
has crept in unnoticed. Is that? Yeah, okay. Keep going. Is that it on verse 4? Yep. Mm-hmm. designated for condemnation. That's what it says in the beginning for ungodly. So read verse 4. Okay. So the ungodly who was designated by God for judgment, correct? For judgment has crept in unnoticed to do what? Unnoticed to pervert grace. What else? Is that it? Yep. Deny. Something before deny, right? Sensuality. Sensuality. Yeah, because this means something. He does a lot of these threes. And so this means something when we, so we want to have all these in there. Okay, pervert the grace, sensuality, and they're denying Jesus. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, that's a synonym. That's the same for sensuality. Yeah, mm-hmm. Is there something in there that sounds clearer than sensuality that you're saying? And how does this, so um, the ungodly designated for, designated by God has crept in unnoticed to pervert grace. And tell me what you just said. <laughs> they given a license for in. So I think that actually points back to them being designated by God because he's given them a license. And so. The beauty of once you do this in your, once you do the content in your Bible, stay with your Bible. Then if you want to, you can look at another version and mark out things that are clear from the other version. That's not wrong to do. Do not look at commentary until you're done with this. Because commentary has did this already for themselves in order to explain to you. So what happens is they're doing the mind work for you. You don't want them to do the mind work for you. You want them to clear up whatever you're confused about once you've done the mind work. And so that's why I haven't um, said anything about commentary. It's not wrong. It's great. I use it. I have to use it. Um, but you don't want to do that until after you've done the, your own mind work. But here what you are restating is that you're not interpreting. Exactly. Exactly. You're not interpreting. You're exactly right. You are restating. You're finding synonyms to do that if it's not clear for you exactly right that's good any other questions so this is what your homework is go and finish your content if you're eager and you're like me and you've loved it go ahead and finish all of it see if you can do it all if you can't just do the content for chapter well yeah Jude that's only one yep so yep for all the verses there you go so that's what you're doing this week you're going through and you're doing the content for Jude if you are eager and you're like, oh, my goodness, this really is good. Let me see if I can do the next step with just the notes that she's giving me. Go right ahead. But we're going to still go through it next week. Um, go through it. And then um, if and I would love if there's some brave people who would like to share. That's how we grow. OK, to expose ourselves. All right, ladies, I, we really have to end. I don't want to, but we have to. Do we really? Oh, I thought we had to go at 1015. Come on, then. Hey. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> all right, well, let's go on. Let's do number four. I'll, oh, can I? Girl, like this? Mm-mm, girl, you got. Yes. Hold on, ladies. Let me get your attention. Come back to me. I know we're all excited. Come back to me. Did you say 10, no more than 20 on content? Is that what you said for us? No less than 10, no, than 10. no more than 20. In content. In content. In content. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Both chapters. Mm-mm, girl.
girl, this is my first time teaching. I want to come back. <laughs> oh, okay. I do want to come back if the Lord says so. <laughs> okay, let's do this set. Okay, somebody else had a question? Mm-hmm. Yep, 20. Yeah, so you have 25 verses in Jude. So how many verses are you going to have to combine? You have to combine five verses. And so if you combine five verses, you're safe. But you can combine more because you can have no less than 10. No less than 10, no more than 20. One chapter, one whole, yes, one, one chapter, you do one, ch I'm, I'm trying to make sure I understand, page 23 will have page 20 of the little content pieces. So are you talking about how many verses? Okay, so you always do homiletics over one chapter. Yes, always over one chapter. So it's very difficult to do homiletics. If you, if somebody says, can you speak to us on Psalms 23, verse 3? I can, but when you do that, then this is what I do. I literally teach each one of those words. Because I can't. I do homiletics for myself so I can understand the whole content. Because what does Pastor tell us? Context is everything. You don't know context unless you've read all of the, the chapter. And so if I have to do Psalms 23, verse 3, I am going to do, in my own personal preparation and study, I'm going to do homiletics over all of Psalms 23. But then when I come in to, with the women, I'm going to just teach verse 23, but I'm going to break up each word so that you know what each one of those words mean. Because the Lord is intentional in why he chose those words, even for you when you do homiletics. It's intentional why the Lord um, drew out those words that made sense to you. Does that make sense? Yes, I do that. Uh huh. Yep, I do that all the time. Yeah. So when he, yeah. Uh huh. Yep, I do it all the time. Yeah, that, that's how my brain works. So that's one of the reasons why I love him so much because our brains operate in, in alliteration. I love alliteration. And so my husband didn't do it. He just he usually says whatever the Bible says. It doesn't have no. It doesn't have anything to it. It's just like, this is what the Bible says. But now he does alliterations, and it was like so exciting. I'm like, Pastor, you got them. I couldn't get them, but you got them. <laughs> it does. It does. It helps you to remember. So, yes, I love alliterations. And it's sweet because the Lord is kind because he gives those alliterations. It's not like I'm trying to be all cute and crafty. They literally just come up out of the text in, in that order. Yeah, so that's really sweet. Okay, did I answer your question? No, you didn't. No, I didn't. And nope, I'm coming back. Nope. Tell me. Okay, do it again. Yeah, I oh I yeah, I do it each chapter. Yeah, I do it each chapter. So like for example, when Pastor was preaching, he's doing what are we going through? John Luke. And so he did what's the last not this the chap the the um, July 4th, I thought he was going to go through more. So I literally go through the whole chapter. So whatever chapter he's on, I do the content for that whole chapter. And then I have divisions, and I think, oh, he's going to do this division right here. And so I, I think I posted it on Facebook, and he came He came to the, the uh, picnic. He was like, Demika, I didn't get that far. I was just like, I know it was a lot, wasn't it? He was like, yeah, I'm not going to get that far. It's going to be like three weeks till I get there. I'm like, ah, it's so good, though. So I kind of slowed down because I, I don't want to get too far ahead of him. And so I slowed down. And so, yes, I do it on, like, if I'm studying with pastor, I do that um, one chapter out of the book. Does that make sense? Okay. Come back. I, I like questions because I don't always know. And so, yeah, I learned. Yes, ma'am. Look, I'm going to sit down. She's trying to say, do you intentionally sort of break that up and making up your 20 yes. content mm -hmm. statements? Yeah, if the all rules still apply so no matter how many verses. Say, I want to look at, mm -hmm. say, 20 sections mm -hmm. and divide that out mm -hmm. and observe how many verses are in that mm -hmm. those, those 20 sections. So, 
Yeah, so I literally, if I did Psalms 19, which I've never done homiletics on Psalms 19, but if I was to do it, I still would look at the whole Psalms 19, and the rules will still apply even to those 100 and something verses. Depends on my time. Depends on my time. Summer, yes, I can do it in one center because I don't teach homeschool. I'm not homeschooling my kids. Like, they do workbooks or something. I don't know. They do something. But during the school year, and the, yes, but in the, um, during the school year, it just really depends on the time. I am very diligent about getting up at 5 in the morning. That's the only time I can study. If not, it's not going to happen. And so I'm a 5 o'clocker, and so I study my Bible from 5 to 6.30. And then if I'm even more disciplined, then I'll walk in the morning, and then by 7, my kids are up. Our schedule's going to change now because they're going to school this year. So I'm talking to the Lord about what that looks like now because I'm trying. Kennedy is my one. She doesn't know it, but she's my one. And so I'm intentionally discipling her without her knowing that I'm discipling her. Um, she's my oldest daughter. And, um, and so she's got to get up at 6 in the morning. I'm going to train her to get up early in the morning. So she has to get up at 6 in the morning starting in school. So then that messes up my time. So then I have to, but they're going to school. So I don't know if the Lord's going to want me to study when they go to school, so it's going to look different this year. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, yeah, it really depends on the time and what I have. So, all right, let's get back. What number are we on? Number five? Oh, number four. Okay. But we're on verse five, right? So are we doing one verse? Are we? Hannah, how much time do I have now? Okay. Okay. You said five and six together? Okay. So tell me what I'm writing for verse 5 and 6. That's all I'm writing. Oh, okay. Remember, that was a good word for me too. Remember, what? God delivered his people. Y'all, that's a good aim right here too. It's like when I'm going through this, I underline words that sh- shoot out to me that's going to help me with my subject sentence and my divisions. Um, and so that stood, that stands out, God delivers. So my aim has to be about God. And so because, and I'm thinking about the class, like the Lord has caused us to call, calling us to stand. And so how are we going to stand? Because God delivers us. And so that stands out to me. Okay, I'm sorry. God delivered. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah. Uh but destroyed unbelievers mm, and angels who abandon. That's good. I love that word, proper dwelling. Mindset, proper position. So there's a position you can be in that's not proper for you. I love that. I love that. God is so right in everything that he says and does. Okay. And angels who abandon proper dwelling have been kept in darkness. And what? And abound. Okay. And bound eternally. Yeah, and that's based on personality. If you want to switch those two words, it wouldn't be wrong. But it's just how you think and how you talk. And that would be your personality on how you put those words. There's no right or wrong. Okay, number five. Verse seven. You Seven and eight, verse seven alone or what? Seven alone? Okay. Someone give me seven. Jenna, you did one. Let Someone give me seven. Just try it, ladies. Just jump out there and try it. We won't remember next week if you messed up or if you did it right. <laughs> 